Hey there, friends. This is Chaplain Kenny. Welcome to another edition of the Deathbed Living with Chaplain Kenny. Hey there, friends. Appreciate you joining us again today. Just wanted to share a little bit of my testimony with you um, for the folks who I've never met, never shared it with. Um, wanted to give you just a little brief snippet, if I can make it brief, that's going to be the challenge, is uh, trying to keep this down to a couple of minutes. I don't want to bore you to death, but I want to give you a little background just for those who might be interested. Um, let's see, grew up in Granite City, Illinois, went to Granite City High School. And when I was in high school, I was always kind of fascinated with, um, not with religion, but with things like the book of Revelation, anything that had anything to do with like the end times or um, uh, the rapture, things like this, that always fascinated me. Um, but interestingly enough, when I was in high school, um, in my senior year, we had to pick a subject for our term paper. The subject I picked was um, demonology, because I was also really fascinated with that back then. I um, enjoyed reading the Satanic Bible, the Anton LaVey Bible back then. Um, I was a nice guy, you know, just interested in a lot, a lot of dark things and did a lot of drugs. And I was pretty typical back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. I graduated in 85. Uh, a couple of years after I graduated, a really good buddy of mine had become a believer. And his name is Brian, hey, Bri? Um, and he and I had partied together for years, you know, uh, done acid, all kinds of crazy stuff for years. And then he found Jesus. Well, actually, Jesus found him. But uh, once that happened, Brian wasn't, his place wasn't the place to party anymore. We used to party, like, in his, uh, in his room, which was in his basement, you know. I can remember it was the place to go to party and stuff. People would come and... Uh, you know, there's like a little window well thing, and people that knock on the door, you know, knock on that. And Brian had a board there that covered up the window, um, I guess because he slept during the day most of the time. But on this board, and Brian's an amazing artist, he had he had done the Rush sign with the, the Rush star man guy in the middle. If I remember right. Anyway, it was on that board, and, you know, you'd knock on the window, and you'd see that board move, and he'd say, go around to the back, you know. Anyway, for years and years, we did this at Brian's house, and it was just the place to go, you know. Um, but then Brian became a believer, and um, Brian had to had to change a lot of things in his life. He couldn't, uh, I mean, once you have a relationship with Jesus, things just naturally start changing in your life. If you really made a commitment to him, you know, he's changing things inside. It's like he comes in and cleans house. And um, anyway... Um, Brian had become a believer, and we were still friends and stuff, just wasn't hanging, you know, partying with everybody in his room anymore. So he brought over this tape from Mike Warnke called Mike Warnke Alive, where he shared his testimony. And the stuff that he was saying on this tape basically was, uh, it was news to me, because I thought that I had violated God's law so much in my life that God had no interest in me. Um, I didn't know I could be forgiven for the things I had done. You know, I mean, if it's interesting how little folks know about biblical truth and what true doctrine really is. You kind of just go on what you've heard, what you've been taught. That's why you really need to look at it for yourself, folks. I don't want to veer off subject here, but read the book of John. Okay? Do it. Do it. It's more important than the rest of this recording, that's for sure. But I do want to share my testimony with you, though. Brian brings over this tape, you know... It's maybe an hour long, something like that. Uh, Mike Warnke shared a lot of stuff about Satanism and uh, the occult and, um, you know, uh, actually a lot of, besides, I mean, you know, I dabbled in that stuff. I was never serious into Satanism or anything. I don't want to uh, glamorize my testimony and make it darker than it really is. I was fascinated with it and did read the Satanic Bible. You know, I did believe uh, um, in Anton LaVey's no, actually, it was Crowley who said, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I was into that. I, I did a portrait of Crowley in my um, um, art class in high school. So I was I was dabbling in all that stuff. I was searching for the answer, searching for truth or something. I didn't know what it was at the time. And like I said earlier, I'd written the uh, 
the term paper on Satanism, and I failed it. <laughs> and then I wrote one on the second coming of Christ, believe it or not, and I think I got a C on that, and I can't remember, but I did pass the class because of that, that different angle in the term paper. Anyway, Brian brought off this, brought over this tape, you know, and there was all kinds of stuff here where it really just uh, was tugging in my heart because I didn't realize I could be forgiven, and I didn't realize that I was really looking for Jesus at the time, you know. But after it was all over, Brian was like, "So, what'd you think? You know, you you are you interested?" And then I said, "Hey, it's great for you, and I'm very happy that you're happy." You know, things seem to be working out good for you. The stuff he said was great, but I'm just not at a place in my life where I'm interested in doing that right now. This was 1988. But Brian left that night, and in the middle of the night in my bed, man, I had been struggling. It's like wrestling with God all night, wrestling with his spirit, I guess. I don't know, uh, but there was a serious battle going on all night. And the Lord changed my heart that night in my bed. When I woke up the next morning, I can remember walking into the kitchen and it seemed like the light was brighter and just, I don't want to seem crazy here, but I really felt like scales had fallen off my eyeballs. Like it says happened to Paul and his conversion and when he you know, lost his blindness, when he got his eyesight back again. So it really, really, really changed my life. But I tell you, it took a while for certain things to fall out, but man, I was hardcore in love with God. You know, I would, uh, I had this, this Bible at the time. It was the, the Bible at, at our house. It was a living Bible, a hardback. And, uh, I was working with my buddy at, uh, at a bank in St. Louis at the time. And he worked a longer shift than I did. We carpooled, and I would have some, like maybe three hours uh, when I, I I would get off before him, and then I'd have about three hours to go in this room to study every day, uh, waiting for him to get off because we rode back to Granite City, Illinois, together after work. You get that? <laughs> anyway, um, I would take that time to study the scriptures every day, and I had this blue highlighter. And every time something would blow my mind, I'd, I'd put a blue line on that, on that sentence, on that verse. And you wouldn't believe it. It's like, when you look through my Bible, this isn't the same Bible, but if you flip through it, flip all the pages, all you'd see is blue everywhere. Because the Lord was so, and continues to be so real to me. The, the truth was just popping off those pages. It was amazing. It was like a miracle to read this truth that I had not known before. And I was a reader, you know. Anyway, the Lord changed my heart. What he does in that situation and what, uh, what makes us different than a lot of folks uh, who talk about uh, being saved is what happened to me in 1988 is God completely changed my heart. He, he removed the scales from my eyes. It's like everything that I saw from then until now, until the day that I die. Um, it's like through new lenses, you know, you process things differently because the Holy Spirit is living in you. You look at things a lot different when that happens, man. When he says, behold, you're a new creation in Scripture, he's serious. Something happens. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't ever have the same struggles because it took me a while to quit certain things. You know what? We're all... It's like every day, I didn't mean to give this sign, what was that, uh, anyway, <laughs> just trying to say that we are a work in progress. It's been 30 years and there's things in my life that the Lord is still working on in my heart. And to be honest, folks, there's some folks who get uh, religious and um, they go to church every week, so they get pious and they think that there's something special, that they're not sinners anymore. But when you become a believer, you don't just go to an altar and repent. Repentance is your new lifestyle, okay? 30 years later, repentance is my daily lifestyle. I constantly have to physically turn away, you know, or in my thought life, I have to turn my thoughts away and put them on positive things, you know. I have to have things like this to remind me what to occupy my thoughts with, you know. This is the kind of stuff we want to be thinking about, folks. And, you know, my mind can be a pretty crazy place at times, so I have to f really make myself refocus, you know? Can any of you relate to what I'm talking about? 
You know, sometimes I'll be in the middle of praying in my car. And it's like my, my mobile prayer closet, you know. I'll be praying while I'm in my car in serious prayer. And something will happen. And just like that, I'll lose focus. And I'll be mad at somebody who did a knucklehead move on the road or whatever. Um, but I lose focus, you know. Or my, my thoughts will drift off onto what we're going to have to eat that night for dinner. I'm a sinful man. I'm striving to be holy, striving every day to follow Jesus, and I think that's what it's all about. You know, we don't uh, cease from becoming sinners. You know, First John says that if you say you're without sin, then you are a liar, and that's true. You know, the, the folks that maybe you hold on a pedestal uh, in your life, the, um, your Christian neighbors or family members who are Christians, you may think that they got no issues, maybe the pastor that you know down the street, but every day especially when you're really in love with jesus you're gonna be struggling it's a struggle i don't mean that i go into the grocery store and go down the beer aisle and oh you know freak out now and there was a time that i did that for sure but no no the lord helps you get a grip on things like that but uh, we're a work in progress until the day we die we're striving to follow jesus we're striving to deny the flesh Take up our cross and follow Jesus. It is a daily challenge and struggle, folks. And, I, and um, if you say that it's not a challenge or a struggle, I, I have to question or ask you to at least search yourself and make sure you're really in the fight. Because Paul talks about this like it's a battle that's going on. It's a race. There's resistance. If you're trying to live for Jesus, you're coming up against a lot of resistance, man. And if everything, if you're coasting right along and you don't, sense any resistance in your life i ask you again dear friend you might want to re-examine your heart and your life are you in this thing called the great commission you know when jesus right before he ascended into the heavens he called us into this thing called the great commission most christians don't even know what that is but it is our great calling that our lord has given us but nobody <laughs> seems like a lot of people don't really care like they haven't signed up but let me tell you if you're a born-again believer, you've been recruited, all right? And you should be proud to be called an ambassador of the Lord because none of us are worthy of that title. We're all just a bunch of sinners. You know, that uh, those of us who are born again have been shown the mercy of God and the grace of God. Even though we're vile, we're sinners, <laughs> okay? Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's what we are, okay? So to make you eligible for this, if you haven't become a part of the family of God yet, you're invited, my friend. But it's pretty wild how the book of John says you cannot come unless the Father draws you. You can't. So you think you're just putting him off until later? The fact is, you're not going to come until the Father draws you. When the Father draws you, you will come. And Jesus says when, when the Father draws you to him, he will no wise cast you out. You'll come to him and he'll save you. He'll change you. He'll change everything in your life always and forever, my friend. You may think that I seem a little weird or crazy, but I don't mind being a fool for God. I really don't. And I truly, truly believe that when Jesus said that unless you have the faith of a child, you won't see the kingdom, he's being serious. You know, it blows my mind. I'm a 51-year-old man right now, and I've been following Jesus for a little over 30 years. But the longer I seek him and the longer I strive to follow him, the more I become like a baby, like a child when it comes to my faith. I mean, you all may look at me and think I'm a nutbag, but um, <laughs> uh, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> I'm a happy nutbag. Uh, I have blessed assurance in my life, folks. Maybe this is where I should take that. I have a faith in my heart that the Lord has given me. And the longer I follow and the more I become like a child, like when it comes to faith, you know, I just trust him. Um, people can come to me with what they would say as logical reasons why they don't believe. But... Um, but I can never not believe. He's shown me too many things in my life for me to not believe. He has shown me things, folks, that there's no logical explanation for. They are miraculous things. Um, 
testimonies that there's no way that anyone could logically explain away this stuff. Carolyn has similar stuff, you know. No one can ever tell me that God doesn't exist and expect me to believe it. Because I ain't going to believe. To me, it takes more faith to not believe than to believe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, I don't want to be a hypocrite. Hypocrisy is when you say you're something that you're not. And what I'm telling you folks is that I'm a wretched sinner. I'm saved by grace. That's it. That's all I got. You know, I don't have anything to offer anyone. Um, all I'm doing is trying to show uh, hungry people where I found bread. I'm just trying to share where I found it. You know, he's changed my life. He's kept me all these years. And realize that we only have a very short time here on this earth. We don't have much time, and our calling is clear. We've been called to preach the gospel, you know, with our lives, with our mouth, everything that is within us. Jesus said that, that your love for him needs to exceed your love for your fellow man, for your parents, your spouse, your kids. You know, are you striving to have that kind of love in your life? That's what I want. Because like I said before on the other videos on Judgment Day, I want to see the Lord and run, just sprint and run into his arms. That's how I want it to be. Do you share that? Are you, are you the same way? I know you have to be. You don't want that to be a day when you're looking around wondering who in the world Jesus is because you don't recognize him because you never know him. You don't want him to say that to you. Depart from me, I never knew you. You know, you may know a lot about Jesus, but do you know him? You know, you may be able to quote scripture and talk about going to church, being raised in church, all kinds of stuff like that. But that means nothing if you're not born again. It means zero. It doesn't matter what label you hang on yourself. If you're not born again, Jesus says you won't see the kingdom. You know, that Pharisee Nicodemus in John chapter 3 said, How can I get back into my mother's womb? It's like, what are you talking about? But Jesus clarified it for him. He said, you have to be born of water and spirit. What Jesus was telling him is, your heart needs to be regenerated, recreated. When you're on that great and glorious day, standing in front of the judgment seat of the Lord, what you need and what I'll have, folks, is I'll be cloaked with the robe of the righteousness of Christ. You may say that sounds crazy and weird, but on that day, it's not going to sound weird at all. It's going to be all that matters. Because if you're standing there naked, just wrapped in your own sin, you're going to be hopeless. There's not going to be a chance for you. You want to be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. You want Jesus standing there next to you saying, this one belongs to me without a question. That's blessed assurance. Never have any doubt or question about your salvation, folks. You know, if you don't feel like the Lord is drawing you to him, then you need to pray and ask him to do that because that's the only way you can come. All right? It's biblical. You know, read the book of John. Don't take my word for it or anybody else's. Pray and read the book of John and he'll show you the truth. He'll open your eyes and give you understanding. And that book will no longer seem like a book of fairy tales to you. Um, keep that in mind. You know, read his word tonight. Uh, contact me. Send me a message. Uh, I'd love to help you along the to the uh, YouTube page for Deathbed Living with Chaplain Kenny, which I think is where you're at right now. But go there. I think I have. It's called a playlist. And on that playlist, you'll see the book of John. That is word for word the book of John the, uh, from the Bible. A visual movie that you can watch if you if you don't. If you haven't had any luck with sitting down and reading the Bible or whatever, you know, if you want to watch it, pray before you watch it. Do whatever it takes. Just fill your life with Christ. Everything in your life should be pointing to Him, okay? That's who you want to be in this life. He's called you to be that person. He said, like I said, your love for Him has to exceed your love for your own children, man. At least strive for that. That's something serious. That's not lackadaisical. You like that fancy word? That's not casual. All right? 
That's a serious relationship with God that we're talking about. That's when you when you look at your relationship with him and he's absolutely everything to you. And whether or not you're in his will means everything to you. Lord, should I go this direction or that direction? You're praying without ceasing in your life. You love him. You know, I often call, like in my Dunamis discipleship class, often call the book of John like a love letter from Jesus to his people. You know, if you were in love with someone uh, and that person went off to be in the military and they were writing you letters every day, every other day, faithfully, those letters are coming in the mail. They're coming every day. He's gone for, or he or she has gone for a couple of years. And they come back to see you. Let's say you're that person who went away. And you come back to see your loved one that you've been writing every day, writing every day, faithfully. You come back and look on the mantle of the fireplace. And you see a big old stack of letters rubber banded together. They ain't never even been opened. That's the same thing, folks. This love letter that he's written to you is promises for you. It's a roadmap to life to get you to heaven. Read it. Read it. There's lots of people preaching crazy stuff out there. It's not the truth. They're like they're like wolves in lambs' clothing. You know, they're offering you prosperity and stuff. Guess what, folks? That's more what the world offered. <laughs> if you want prosperity, you're not wanting to become a believer or be involved in the church. I'm going to light this a little more. See if this light helps. A little bit. You know what I'm saying, though? They're preaching prosperity doctrine. That's no gospel at all, you know? Um, but don't get caught up in that stuff. Following Jesus is about giving. It's about following him and serving other people. Make sure you got it right. Make sure you're going to the right place. If they're constantly begging for money and stuff like that, folks, run away. Run away. You're not in the right place. If that's where you're going and that's what they're saying, run away from that place. All right? I love you, folks. I really appreciate you coming and, and listening. Give me a few minutes of your time. I hope I haven't gone on too long, but I really am passionate about uh, trying to help you. Um, not that I'm Mr. Know-it-all, but I just know where to find the answers. And, and, uh, and I'm in the textbook a lot. You know, he calls sinners. He's come to save sinners, and that's you and I. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. All right, I know I said that before, but I can never say that enough. Oh.